Hello, my name is Scott Overpeck, and I'm a meteorologist here at the National Weather Service in Albuquerque, and I also have Daniel Porter on the far left, or my far left, and he's a meteorologist as well, and we're here with Andrew Mangum, our hydrologist, and we're going to talk about really some of the river issues that we've seen the last uh, several weeks, and I guess the best introduction question is to ask you, Andrew, what's the 50,000 foot overview of our river situation in New Mexico. Yeah, well, we are in a slightly unusual situation. The rivers are all running pretty high right now. If you look at the USGS page, for example, they have these categories that go from low to much above high. And if you go to the northern part of the state, any river that's not controlled right now is running above normal to much above normal, and in some instances, even record high for this time of year. Now, what's unusual about this is that when we talk about high flows in rivers in New Mexico, we generally associate that with something like the monsoon season, where heavy rains are causing flash flooding that are flowing into the creeks and driving these higher flows. This year, it's a slightly different ballgame. This year, we're dealing with genuine river flooding and genuinely high river flows because of a heavy snowpack during the winter and some warm temperatures that are now driving a rapid melt. So, Andrew, when was the last time we've had flows this high uh, in the Rio Grande. In the Rio Grande and Albuquerque, the last time we got close to being this high was June of 2019, right? So it's been four years since we've seen flows even close to this level, yes. which is really remarkable. And in fact, if you look back over the course of our period of record, this flow that we just hit the other day is in the top 10 for flows over the last 80 years. Wow, that's impressive. It really is, yeah. yeah. So what controls the flow of the Rio Grande through Albuquerque and locations south of here? Right, yeah, the Rio Grande, and everyone should be aware of this, the Rio Grande is a deeply controlled river, right? And so what's controlling it here in Albuquerque and all the way south down to Elephant Butte is Cochiti Dam um, up near the Cochiti Pueblo. <clears throat> so that dam will catch all the water that's coming down from the north and then they will control the amount that gets released. It is a, It can be a flood control dam, Right now, they're releasing close to the maximum amount that they want to release, which is about 5,000 CFS. They can go higher, but there are issues if they do that, that they're trying to avoid. And so that's what's driving the high flows right now. They are also perfectly capable of shutting off the river by turning it down. And we saw that last year when the Rio Grande actually bottomed out and went dry. Um, they were not releasing very much out of Cochiti. They were trying to hang on to their water. And there was nothing coming in between Albuquerque and Cochiti. And that's another important point. Even though it is controlled, there are a couple of rivers that come in. You've got the Santa Fe River, you've got the Jemez River, you've got Galisteo, right? And if we got a big rainstorm up in the hills that fed into those rivers, we could see higher flows that have nothing to do with Cochiti. But Cochiti itself could then kind of turn the dial on how much they release to mitigate any high level flows that we had in town. All right. Interesting. So to follow up, you used the word flow and then CFS. Sure. Can you do a quick kind of review? What exactly is that? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about rivers, we talk about, often we talk about the height of the river. That's what people go look at, right? They go look and they see the height of the river. That's something we call stage, right? Flow is measured in cubic feet per second, which if you want to kind of imagine it, you can think about a beach ball. One beach ball is about the size of one cubic foot. So if I say there's 5,000 CFS flowing down the river, think about 5,000 beach balls flowing by every second. So that kind of seems like it would cause a pretty decent impact. So have we seen any impacts along the Rio Grande? What, what is that looking at? Because I know we've gotten some reports from our emergency managers and other, other uh, partners that we work with. And, and yeah, there's been some erosion and some things like that. Can you go into some... Yeah, absolutely. Info so, on that. absolutely. The um, the impacts really do have to do with the force of the water on the banks at this point. When you go through a long period of low flows, the banks get built up over time by lots and lots of small scale thunderstorms washing down sediment, and you end up with a not really well packed down bank, and that bank is vulnerable. So when you get a heavy flow that produces a lot of force on those banks, you get these shear forces running right along the bank and those start to chew into those banks. And so, yeah, we have seen river banks being eroded fairly rapidly uh, back to a certain point. We've also seen overbank flow into the primary floodplain, which is something we can talk about in a moment, mm -hmm. uh, that is cutting off access to areas that people think of as primarily recreation areas that they should have access to. Uh, so and those are largely the impacts that we see. If the river got much higher than this, like a foot and a half higher, 
we would we could see some other more profound impacts. If it got up to eight feet, we'd start seeing it overtopping levees. And we are blessed with a fairly comprehensive levee structure uh, all up and down the Rio Grande uh, that protects it up to about eight feet. And then some of the older levees will start to be overtopped and we could get that. The other problem with some of those levees is quite frankly, they are quite old. Uh, and some of the levees do tend to start to leak and shift a little bit if it gets even up to say seven feet, which is part of why the Army Corps of Engineers doesn't release the maximum amount that they think the channel could hold. They keep it down to a lower level so that they don't start to compromise any of these older levees. Okay, so we get these impacts. So what are, what are some things that can be done uh, for, I guess, mitigating or keeping flooding from happening along the river? So there's basically two families of mitigation that you can wade into. There's structural mitigation. When we think about structural mitigation, we're thinking sandbags, we're thinking levees, we're thinking dams. These kind of things control the flow of water and keep it chained and artificially raise the riverbanks to keep it within a larger channel. If you want to talk about mitigating erosion, you can think about armoring techniques. And so if people are familiar with the term riprap, this is where you see a riverbank that's covered up with big cobbled stones. The idea is that you know, the force of the water is capable of moving sand, but it's not strong enough to pick up those rocks, right? So that's bank armoring, and that's one way to protect banks against erosion. Those are all structural techniques, and they're great. They're really effective for a while, but structures degrade, and you get dams that fail and levees that break, and that kind of thing can happen. So a more popular or growing in popularity solution is what we call non-structural solutions. And this is where you try to work with the river a little bit. So this involves things like buying out properties that are too close to the river so that you can create an open space that can be flooded and allow that to happen and let the natural forces of the land work with the river and the forces that are gonna be at play in the river there. And so that's when you get end up creating something like a primary floodplain. And so if you wanna think about floodplains, any river has, all rivers have a flood channel or a, a river channel that it goes through. When you get down into flat areas, most rivers have a flood plain, and this is a broad expanse of land right around the river where the river tends to, when it gets up to its, you know, up above the channel, spread out and flood through, right? And that lets the water kind of spread, it slows everything down, can be a really effective tool for mitigating flooding. And a lot of cities have taken that strategy with creating open areas and riparian areas right along the stream that can be flooded where there's no property, and it keeps everyone safe and sound without having to invest in and then maintain some of these larger structural solutions. So that's very different from the diversion channels we have in, in Albuquerque. Very different from the diversion channels. That's another that's another path, right, that can be done. That's another structural solution where you 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 know you break the water up into pieces essentially and send it down through safe areas. Uh, and that's a very popular solution. And you know, you'll see that being used up on the Red River of the North around Fargo, a major diversion channel, for example, is used to route that river around the city. Um, those are good techniques as well, but they are structural solutions. So the bosque that everyone looks at along the river, and we're, it's really blessed to have that here in the city. It's a beautiful resource that is fun to go walking and, and biking through. The bosque is a primary floodplain. It is what we call a riparian area, an area with a lot of trees and vegetation in the primary floodplain of the river. That's actually better than a normal floodplain be honest with you, because the trees and the vegetation perform a couple of more functions. They slow down the velocity of the water. They give that slower water that gives it time for sediment to settle out. So it cleans the water as it goes back into the river and improves water quality downstream. So Andrew, there's a lot of people that love to go down uh, into the Bosque. What should people do or not do if they happen to be hiking or walking or what have you down in the Albuquerque Bosque? Well, so, uh, you know, the most obvious thing, and everyone will probably think this, is to not go into the water, right? Stay away from the areas where you see open water. But what's less obvious is that you also want to be watching how fast that water is going and don't even go too near it. Some of the reports that we're getting are we're talking about losing 150 feet of riverbank pretty rapidly from these erosions. And these banks can be very unstable. So if you're maybe 50 feet away from the water and it's flowing quickly, you can be sitting there thinking, I'm fine, I'm nowhere near the water, but the bank is rapidly eroding this unstable and could give way under your feet. So as with almost any kind of flooding, the main point here is to just stay away from the water. 
yeah. if you can. And that water's pretty cold this time. It's extremely cold. Yeah, we're talking about snow melt water. So we're talking about water that's in the 30s and low 40s tops, right? And that kind of water can be extremely dangerous yeah. if you fall into it. It'll take your breath away and it'll freeze up your muscles inside 10 minutes. Yeah, it's pretty dangerous. Well, I think that is some really good information and we appreciate those of you that are listening to us to take the time to do so. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the National Weather Service.